Welcome back everyone. This is my first reading vlog of the year, and it's going to be quite a long one because I read quite a lot of books this month. I've got lots of books to talk about today, so let's get started. First up on the list we have the first two books in Anne Rice's Mayfair Witches trilogy, The Witching Hour and Lasher. The Lives of the Mayfair Witches trilogy chronicles the historical and present-day lives of the Mayfair family, who are a very large, very incestuous family of witches whose fortune seems to be both made and broken by the spirits called Lasher some members of the family have a connection to. The first book in the series, which I reviewed on this channel so I won't talk about it too much here, is a huge gothic sprawling masterpiece in my opinion. It does all the things I expect and enjoy from Rice, very complex narratives, very detailed backstories for characters, and a very complex and new mythology. Lasher, the second book in the series, dials back a bit from that kind of gothic atmosphere and the grand storytelling, and is a bit more in the kind of urban fantasy vein of some of her Vampire Chronicles books like The Tale of the Body Thief, although there is still some world building and backstory in this story too. Now I am enjoying Lasher quite a lot still, although I would say that it does take a few weird left turns that I wasn't expecting, and some of these left turns are good and some of them not so much. One of the things that I'm not enjoying too much with this book is that Rice seems to be sidelining some of the main characters from the previous book, and while she does replace those characters with some cool characters, I really want to get to the, the main story, the story that we left on the cliffhanger in the first book. And so far we're not focusing too much on that, we're focusing more generally on the Mayfair Witches. So I do hope that we get some focus on those main characters at some point in this book. I guess we'll see. I'm not finished with the book yet, and I will be reviewing this book at some point in the channel once I have finished it. But yeah, overall, great trilogy. I'm still enjoying the second book, but I'm not enjoying it as much so far as I did the first one. Alright, next up we have the third book in the Gentleman Bastards series by Scott Lynch, The Republic of Thieves. Now in general, The Gentleman Bastards follows the story of Locke Lamora, who belongs to the Gentleman Bastards, who are a cult of, basically, criminals, and they in e and in each book we basically have a different kind of setup as they're involved in a different scheme. In the previous book, Red Skies Under Red Seas, which I really enjoyed, the kind of theme was swashbuckling and lots of seafaring stuff, and I really enjoyed that. This book isn't so adventurous in that way, instead we're following a political intrigue kind of plot, as Locke and his companion John are trying to sway the results of an election. Also what makes this book interesting is that they are now competing against their old fellow gentleman Bastard and one of Locke's former love interests, Sabatha. Now there's a lot of build up to this book because Sabatha hasn't actually appeared in the previous two volumes, and I do think that her appearance here is well timed, and I think that the stuff between her and Locke and their relationship was some of the better stuff in this book. That being said, I did find the political intrigue plot just a bit meh. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't as well fleshed out or engaging as the plots in the previous book, and I also felt like the secondary characters in this book just weren't as grabbing or interesting as the secondary characters in previous books. So I do think that overall this was a bit of a misstep, and I will talk about this in a little more detail in a review that I'm going to be doing of this book coming soon. But yeah, overall I did still enjoy the book, it wasn't bad, but it was a bit of a dip because the previous two books in the series were like some of the best fantasy that I've ever read, so it is a bit of a shame that this book doesn't quite live up to the previous two. That's it for sci-fi fantasy books, we're now on to classics which I read a lot of this month, and starting with one that I didn't enjoy very much, and this book is called Sybil, or The Two Nations, by Benjamin Disraeli, and it was published in 1845. Now Sybil is a cross between a political novel and a romance. We have an aristocratic man who falls in love with a working class woman, and the novel explores themes around politics and society and all that kind of stuff. Now there were some things about the book I enjoyed. I thought that Sybil was a very good and interesting character, and I also liked some of the characters in her family as well. I also felt like with the male protagonist, his family life, the conflicts and the aristocracy that he belongs to, were really interesting. However, what I didn't like about the book is that it really struggled to balance the romantic side of the plot with the describing the way politics works and parliament and all the nitty-gritty kind of stuff about that. There were parts in the book where you would basically have some plot going and you'd have stuff focusing on relationships, and then the book would stop to give you an exposition about politics and people's aristocratic backgrounds, and it was just really jarring to read, and it felt like the story was being overtaken by just an exposition dump about politics. Now, as a reader, I don't, in general, like political or social novels, and if I do enjoy them, 
I enjoy ones where the writer is able to convey the political message through the story and the narrative that they're telling, and I didn't think that this really did a good job with that in this book. I found that it was telling a love story, which did have, you know, themes of uh, politics and social stuff in there, but then there was this political side of it that was completely detached from that, and the two just didn't go very well together and could have gone together a lot better, in my opinion. So I didn't enjoy this book too much. It was probably the worst thing that I read this month. Uh, it was also a Christmas present for my partner, so... <laughs> but never mind, he also got me another book that I think I will like, so we'll see uh, if that's the case when I get to it. Next up, we have a book that I did enjoy a lot more, and that is City of Night by John Ritchie, published in 1963. So this book was picked for the reading club that I belong to. It's a semi-autobiographical book in which the narrator, who is a hustler, basically tells the story of his life as a hustler and the various people that he meets during this time. The narrator basically drifts from city to city. It's a very lonely, isolating book, and he meets various kinds of people. He meets fellow hustlers and has relationships with them. He meets drag queens. He meets a woman who owns a gay bar. He meets police, all kinds of people. And the book basically focuses on these different kinds of people in various chapters. I really enjoyed this book. It was incredibly dark and not sentimental at all about this kind of underground world of hustling. You know, there are some pretty dark characters in the book. But at the same time, Retchie always manages to find ways to empathise with these broken people. And it was a really affecting story in places. It's certainly not a book that has any kind of plot, per se. It's much more a character study of these various people. And what I liked about the book is that every single character that we focused on was very different, had a very different backstory, a very different reason to be in the situation that they're in, and a very different way of dealing with it. So it was a really rich story with some great character work, and I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to talking about it in my book club. Moving on now, back in time again, we have As You Like It by Shakespeare. I was watching a booktube video by a booktuber called 155 Books, where she basically read one Shakespeare play a month, for the whole of last year, and then made a video about it at the end of the year. And I thought that was a cool idea, and thought I'd do the same thing myself this year. So the first play that I picked was As You Like It. As You Like It follows the story of what is generally considered to be one of Shakespeare's best female characters, Rosalind. Rosalind is a noble woman who, in the play, she flees her kind of noble background because she's going to be persecuted by her uncle, and she flees and goes into the forest of Arden with her cousin, and because it's Shakespeare, of course, she dresses up as a young boy. And while she's in the forest, she gets up to all kinds of crazy hijinks, meets all kinds of crazy characters. And the key thing that she does is she finds her love interest in the forest. And as a boy, she tries to challenge him to see how much he really cares about her. Now, I read this play, and then after I read it, I watched a production of it. And when I read the play, I liked bits of it. It's got some of Shakespeare's most famous speeches in, like the All the Words of Stage speech, for instance. But I wasn't really able to see the comedy all that much, because Shakespearean English is just really hard to read. But when I watched the production of it, I enjoyed the play a lot more, because I could see the comedy, and I could tell, you know, what the lines were meaning. So, when I, when I read it, didn't like it that much, thought it was okay. When I watched it, I really enjoyed it, and would definitely recommend if you want to read this play, rather than read it, maybe try and find a good production of it, because I think it does a lot better on screen or on the stage than it does written down. I'll definitely go back to it though and read it again now that I sort of know what's going on a bit more, because it might be that now I know what's going on more, I can appreciate the text itself a bit more as well. But yeah, it's a pretty good comedy. There's lots of gender-bendy stuff, which is always fun. It's always interesting stuff with Shakespeare around gender, when you have characters like Rosalind disguising themselves as a boy, and her love interest falling in love with her in some ways while she's a boy. There's definitely some interesting stuff there about gender, and this is definitely one of the more interesting Shakespeare plays if you're interested in that dimension of his work. So yeah, a great play, and I'm definitely glad that I decided to watch it as well as read it, because it did help me appreciate it a lot more. Next up we have Naked Lunch by William Burroughs. Now I've definitely read some weird books, but this probably takes the cake for the strangest thing I've ever read. Naked Lunch is a book that was written by William Burroughs, who is a well-regarded beatnik writer, and he basically wrote this, or parts of this novel, while he was incredibly drugged up on heroin, and he doesn't actually remember, or didn't really remember, writing a lot of the sequences in this book. It's basically told in various vignettes, and actually in a description of the book, or introduction to the book, Burroughs actually says that you could read the book 
in any order. You don't actually have to read the chapters in order because that's just how crazy and jumbled the story is. Now, it does actually have a narrative, or at least it's supposed to have a narrative, and that is the story of a guy and junkie called William Lee, whose name changes constantly in the story, so it's really hard to know whether you're following William or you're just focusing on different characters. And he goes from place to place and eventually finds his way into a dreamlike world called the Interzone, where things get even weirder than they were in the previous chapters. Now, this novel is very hard to read, but Burroughs does have a nice sense of humour and wit, and some of the stuff that happens is so absurd that it is quite funny at times. That being said, it's also a very dark depiction of what drugs does to a person. Burroughs is definitely not a writer who wants to idealise these kinds of topics. In fact, in the addition to the book that I had, there's a passage or an extract from a work that he did where he described the intentions of the book, and he basically seems to think that heroin addiction is actually a mental illness, you know, being addicted to it, and people need help and support like you would get help if you had any other kind of mental illness, rather than persecution. So it's really interesting to know that backstory going into the story, because Burroughs isn't trying to idealise this, he's trying to show you how crazy it is, how much it messes up your life, and how twisted it can make a person. There are definitely some uncomfortable scenes in this book, it's definitely not a story for the faint-hearted, not just because there is some dark subject matter, but also there's just some pretty gross uh, scenes as well. So it's certainly not a book for everyone to read, but if you want to read something completely bonkers and off the wall, uh, then, then give this a go, because it certainly is that. And although it is dark, there is humour in there, and there is some absurdism in there. So if you like that kind of surreal, crazy, off-the-wall stuff, then definitely give this a go. Next up on the list, we have Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Lord Byron. I never really was one for poetry, but after reading The Fairy Queen, which is a huge narrative poem, I really did get into narrative poetry, and so I thought I'd carry that on while I was still interested, and pick up some of Lord Byron's work, and I thought I'd start with Child Harold's Pilgrimage. This was uh, not necessarily the best decision to make, because I did like parts of this, but it certainly wasn't, in my opinion, anywhere near as good as The Fairy Queen. So Child Harold's Pilgrimage tells the story of Harold, who is a previously debauched nobleman who leaves that life of sin behind because he gets bored of it and starts to see how terrible the world is. And he goes on this pilgrimage uh, and basically sees, you know, war and how terrible war is and basically laments how horrible different cultures and countries are to each other. Now what I did like about the poem is Lord Byron's language. There were just some gorgeous lines in this book, some that are really profound, some that are really funny. Another thing that I enjoyed was that this poem is written in a very similar style, either in parody or emulation, of Spencer's Fairy Queen. So it was really cool to have this connection between this poem and that text, which I didn't actually know when I picked it up, so this was a complete coincidence. Uh, but I thought that was really cool, and I liked how Byron was playing around with that Spencerian, if that's how you say that, style, and riffing off of the Fairy Queen in that way. Unfortunately, what kept the poem back for me it's a kind of a similar issue uh, to the issue I had with Sybil, which is that it's making political statements, which is fine, but it's doing it in a way that to me isn't particularly artistic. It felt very much like this is... the pilgrimage is just kind of a very weak framing narrative uh, for Byron just to bemoan uh, the political situation and bemoan war. Now, of course, it's fine for writers to go on about politics and all that kind of stuff, but I think it's important for me as a reader for the writer to combine the storytelling element with the political element. And when I read something that just feels like the story element is basically just a vague setup in order to do the political stuff, it just doesn't come across well to me. It just reads like a polemic rather than a piece of art to me. That being said, it is a good political speech if that's how you want to read it. And I, like I say, I do enjoy the message. I think it's really well done as a polemic, but as a narrative I just don't think it works very well. And finally, last thing on the list is A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Although I did certainly enjoy Ulysses, I am nowhere near ready yet to try Finnegan's Wake, but I am ready to keep reading on with Joyce because I really enjoy his writing style, so I thought I'd give this book a try. One, because it's shorter, two, because it's not anywhere near as experimental as Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake, and so I thought it'd be a nice way to Keep reading Joyce, but not, you know, for it not to be such an exhausting task. This novel is autobiographical, 
It's drawing on Joyce's experiences as a child growing up, and his experiences as a young man. And he uses the character of Stephen Dedalus, who is basically a self-insert for himself, to tell that story. It was interesting to read this because in a sense it's a prequel to Ulysses, or at least Stephen is a character who appears again in Ulysses. So it was interesting to kind of get a broader picture of the Stephen character. And certainly in this book I felt like Stephen was easier to empathise with than he is in Ulysses. I think in Ulysses he's a bit of a, a bit of a douche really. So it was nice to get a broader picture of Stephen's character. I haven't got too far with this book yet, we're still at the part of the novel where Stephen is still a child. But I am enjoying it so far. The stream of consciousness narration style is still there, but it's a lot more comprehensible. And I would say that, based on the Joyce books that I've read so far, if you want to get into Joyce but don't want to go for the extreme ones, this is definitely a good way in because because it does have its complex style, but it's certainly very readable, even if it still is a little bit experimental. But yeah, not much is going on yet in the book. We're basically just focusing on young Stephen and his relationship with adults and in particular the ways in which adults are pretty terrible to children uh, in the time period. And even now I can sort of relate to the hypocrisy of adults. It's certainly a theme in this book and it's certainly a, something I think most of us can relate to if we think back to our childhoods. And I think that that theme has done really well in the early parts of the book. Also I think it's a good example of an author who is combining the social commentary, you know, looking at the ways in which the education system has, you know, abuses children at the time, but does it in a way that doesn't detract from the narrative. The two things are imbued together with each other, so it's a lot more effective. And this is the kind of social commentary that I really like in books, when you're combining the narrative, the storytelling, with the political message, rather than just, you know, splitting the two up and having a narrative as an excuse to go on a bit of a rant. <laughs> Alright, so that's it for this video. Let me know what books you've been reading this month. Given that it's a new year, have you set yourself any New Year's resolutions to read more books? Also, if you've read any of these books, do let me know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel for updates for new videos. But that's it for this video though, so take care everyone, I'll see you all next time.